It's a minute after, so why don't we get started? Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Elbert from Johns Hopkins and uh, from the MARTA Council. So I'm going to welcome back for the third afternoon of MARTA 2024, our annual meeting. We're uh, quite excited at things that have happened already in the meeting and for another great day. Um, so I'm going to just give you a quick overview of the day and then turn it over. Um, we have two sessions today, as well as a, a poster. Session four is on industry and translation work, a really important topic for all of us in materials. That'll be chaired by Corey Oshis and uh, Gen Yin from Hopkins and Georgetown. Um, we do have shared docs, again, for people to participate uh, in discussion and ask questions and things that can be set up. Um, I'll post that link or Selena will post that link in the Q&A so you'll have it. Um, then there'll be some short presentations, panel discussion, and then we have a third poster session, something new this year for MARTA. This is one on materials data platforms and repositories. Uh, this turned out to be extremely popular. We have over 30 uh, repositories and platforms represented where people will be in posters. It's far too many for you to see everything, but we have a list of them and a links to all of them. So it's a great chance to see what's out there and what might be resources you're not already used to having and letting MARTA start to disseminate that information. We'll come back and Corey and Gen will give us another session. They'll chair a session on education and workforce development. Always a really important topic for uh, anything to do with the MGI. We'll have a different set of shared notes. Those will also be listed um, and another set of panel presentations. Uh, near the end of the day, we'll summarize things. There'll be a chance for one of our student organizers, Kat Nichol from Purdue, to announce the outstanding poster awards and presentations from the student and postdoc posters of the last two days. We had a lot of great posters, uh, a lot of great scores. Um, two stood out, uh, according to judges, so we'll hear about those. Um, and then um, we'll get some closing comments from Kate Brinson. The original agenda said Peter Voorhees. Peter can't be with us at that point, so Kate will step in and close the meeting. Uh, there'll be a discussion of some folks stepping off the council who've been really important to MARTA through the first founding years and our newly elected councillors who are joining. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Corey and Gen to uh, run the day. Perfect. Thank you, David. Can everyone Thanks, see David. me and hear me? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, he hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Osis. And welcome to the last day of MARTA 2024. Um, I'm joined with uh, Gen Yin, who's going to be helping lead the sessions today. Um, just a quick introduction. Just a quick introduction of uh, of uh, myself. Gen will, will introduce himself a little later. But I'm a new assistant professor in materials science and engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my research focuses on materials informatics, um, especially of uh, new energy materials, including for hydrogen generation and energy storage. So we will kick it off with our first session in industry and translation work. Um, the format is the same as the other days. We'll begin with a few introductions and, and some slides um, for each of the panelists. And then we will wrap up with, a, um, with an open forum of, of questions. So I'm going to begin today with uh, Dr. Christine Allen, uh, who's a full professor at the University of Toronto. Um, she's an internationally recognized leader with more than 160 publications in drug formulation and development, uh, co-founder and CEO of a VC-backed company that's accelerating pharmaceutical drug development through integration of AI, automation, and advanced computing. Um, she's a co-founder and a board member at NanoVista, Inc., and she's had numerous leadership positions in academia and scientific societies. Um, and they include uh, inaugural associate vice president and vice provost of strategic initiatives and interim dean of the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. And with, with no further ado, uh, I will uh, pass it over to Dr. Allen. Thank you for joining us. Dick, can you see my screen? Is everything okay? Looks great. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Really appreciate this opportunity, and I know we only have a few minutes, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, so, as Corey said, my name is Christine Allen, professor at the University of Toronto. I've worked there. I joined from industry. Uh, I'm an expert in drug formulation development. I uh, worked very closely uh, with pharmaceutical companies, usually working with two or three pharmaceutical companies each year to help them with formulation of their drugs and moving their drugs uh, into the clinic. And, uh, and I also have a, a startup that is in the space that I'm going to be talking about uh, today. 
So just to make sure that we're um, on the same page and everybody knows what drug formulation is because many people uh, in fact don't, uh, and, and I understand that. Um, if you go into the pharmacy and you're looking to buy, let's say Tylenol, you have a headache, um, you might walk down the aisle and you'll see Tylenol available as capsules or tablets. If you're in the children's aisle, you'll see it available as a syrup. And the active pharmaceutical ingredient that would have been identified through drug discovery efforts is acetaminophen. The formulation uh, or the way that drug is packaged is the tablet, the capsule, or the syrup. And that's the space that I'm talking about today, that formulation. And formulations can really transform active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, into viable and effective medicines. And they do that uh, through ensuring the stability of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, enabling administration to patients. And importantly, um, they improve the efficacy of that active and pharmaceutical ingredient, and they prevent unwanted toxic side effects. Now, having said that, um, there's actually a very high failure rate when it comes to drug development. Nine out of 10 drugs that enter clinical development fail. Only one of 10 drugs makes it through. And the leading causes for drug failure are safety and efficacy. And yet every drug is formulated. And I just told you that formulations address safety and efficacy issues. And the reason that we believe that this happens is that pharma companies are not always moving the best drug formulation into the clinic. And this is largely due to the fact that we're stuck in this very old way of doing things. Traditional pharmaceutical formulation development um, is reliant on what I call a benchmarking and trial and error approach. You come to me with a drug, I look at the physical chemical properties of that drug, and I look for what's worked for other drugs that are like this. And I start with that formulation, and then I use trial and error to tweak and optimize, and then we move the formulation forward uh, into the clinic. And what this does is it leaves tremendous opportunity for innovation on the table. And we end up exploring this very narrow design space. And in fact, I understand why we take this approach. We take this approach because the formulation field or formulation in itself can be overwhelming. So if we think about oral administration of a drug, there are more than 10 billion possible formulations that could be used for formulation of a single drug. And if we just to put that number into context, there are only 20,000 drugs that are FDA approved for administration um, by the oral uh, method. And so as I show you here on this slide, right, more than 10 billion possible combinations, only, only 20,000 drugs approved. And when we look at those formulations that have been, a, that have been approved um, and the formulations that have been used in those products, we, we estimate that it's less than 0.01% of the design space that has actually been explored. And when you think about that, what if one of those formulations that's not explored could completely transform the properties and the performance of your drug? Since I started at the University of Toronto, I've been interested in um, the in, in finding data-driven approaches to drug formulation, to removing that trial and error approach. And in the last four years, I've worked with my colleague, Alon asper -Guzik, to apply AI and now automation to this problem. And we have a number of papers in this area the first of which was really focused um, around using machine learning. So we curated data sets of a type of formulation, use those data sets to train machine learning models, and then use that to then predict the performance of specific formulations and for in inverse design of formulations for specific drugs. Then we got into um, looking at the development of an oral formulation uh, of another drug. And in this case, what we did was we selected a design space and we only prepared using automation about 10 formulations that comprised about 10% of that design space, use that data to train models, and then we're able to virtually extrapolate across the remainder of that, of that design space to identify an optimal formulation. Um, and then finally, more recently, um, we've been using, uh, we've now developed a self-driving lab, which integrates AI and automation and really closes that loop. And beyond that, and I've, I've highlighted this here, it's a recent data set that we've put out. My lab is very much committed to, uh, in addition to being entrepreneurial and starting companies and working with pharma, we are also curating data sets. We see the value in that uh, and putting that out there uh, for the research community. So this is one of them around uh, nano emulsion formulations and includes, a, it's a data set of about 650 formulations. 
So in terms of the challenges that I see in this space or that we're seeing in this space, um, first of all, you might think that there's been significant integration of AI um, into drug development, and there has been in the drug discovery space and clinical development space. And when I say clinical development, I mean design of clinical trials, identifying and recruiting patients, uh, monitoring and improving patient adherence, and so on. But where there hasn't been a lot of effort is in the formulation space. And in fact, this is a um, discussion paper that was just put out by the FDA um, that's focused on the use of AI and machine learning in the development of drug products and doesn't even mention drug formulation and delivery. It's solely focused on discovery and uh, clinical development. Beyond that, in terms of the challenges that we've seen, um, you know, curation of robust data sets, I'd been a, an editor uh, for 10 years and was aware of some problems in the scientific literature, but have become far more um, aware of this now, just in terms of the data that is missing in publications and renders those studies then uh, irreproducible, which is obviously difficult when it comes to really curating reliable data sets. Beyond this, there's a fear and apprehension re related to AI that we encounter in discussions with uh, big pharma uh, in other in other uh, in companies in other sectors, and then finally a lack of expertise and infrastructure to really implement um, this effectively. So we've been able to do that through our collaboration with Alon Asperguzic and and his research group. Um, but when you speak with companies, they don't have the expertise necessarily and or the infrastructure to really uh, to implement some of these approaches. Um, and so that's that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to um, to our next panelist, who is uh, doc, Dr. David Hicks. Uh, David is an engineering manager for modeling and simulation at Lyft, which is a national manufacturing innovation institute that specializes in materials, processes, and system development. He's based out of Detroit, Michigan. Um, David, Dr. Hicks serves as the primary software architect and advisor to connect commercial simulation tool sets and perform simulations to accelerate the development and manufacturing of metal ceramics in their composites. Um, Dr. Hicks is also an adjunct center professor at Duke University, working with the Center for Extreme Materials. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Hicks. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Osis. Appreciate the introduction. And thank you again for everyone um, allowing me to speak in today's panel. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see a PowerPoint presentation in presenter yep. mode. Perfect. That's right. um, so I guess, yes, to reiterate, um, my name is David Hicks and I work at Lyft, which is one of the DOD sponsored uh, National Manufacturing Innovation Institutes. And there are actually, um, I wanna say 17 or 18 different uh, manufacturing innovation institutes uh, as part of Manufacturing USA. And each of these institutes focuses on different aspects of accelerating manufacturing. So it could be digital manufacturing, um, biological system manufacturing, um, or even cybersecurity. Uh, and actually at Lyft, we focus uh, more on uh, general materials or advanced materials development. So looking at how we can accelerate the manufacturing of ceramics, metals, and their composites, so CMCs or um, MMCs, so ceramic matrix composites or metal matrix composites. Um, and so I wanted to highlight uh, at the bottom here, this is actually um, something that we talk about a lot uh, when we reference Lyft is really what we're aiming to do is accelerate um, technologies through the manufacturing readiness level scale or MRL scale, uh, basically into commercialization. So we're kind of a, in a unique position where we're not necessarily 100% an industry type company or an academic or research based company, we kind of sit in the middle. Uh, and so we essentially sit in uh, what many to refer many refer to as the valley of death. So unfortunately, this is where a lot of these good ideas, these good materials, these good manufacturing processes, unfortunately, they go to die and they aren't necessarily carried into commercialization. So, so this is really where we sit as an organization. A lot of what we try to do is we've identified needs in the DOD um, customer base. Um, and then also an industry, and we know what these challenges are. And so we try to reach out and almost essentially, you know, um, accelerate some of these good ideas that are coming from academia and national labs, basically through this um, valley of death. So that way they can um, come into commercialization uh, and into industry relevant applications. 
Um, so kind of, uh, again, this is a very high level view of what we do at Lyft. I'm happy to talk about the details as we go through the panel uh, discussions. Uh, but really what we work on at Lyft is kind of the full life cycle of a material. So for instance, looking at the design aspect, the building aspect, and then the testing. And so a lot of the work that I do is actually in the modeling and simulation. So more of the digital engineering is what we refer to it here. And looking at how can we model the material as a function of the entire life cycle. So for instance, starting from chemistry, going into uh, process models. So how does the material feign change as a function of maybe being additively manufactured or um, going through a casting and forging process. How does that affect the microstructure? So mod um, phase field modeling, going up to crystal plasticity uh, to kind of see how the mechanical response of this system will be affected. And then of course, most importantly, what is the application? What is the end state and how does it perform in these technologies? And so again, we're focused mostly for metal, ceramics and CMCs. Um, and so that's mostly in the design space or the um, virtual space, but we also, once we kind of have an understanding of this in the virtual space, we want to actually make these materials. And a lot of times these are novel materials, so we need to have uh, capabilities in-house to actually manufacture these. So this is something that also Lyft works on is custom powder development um, and custom wire and basically being able to put these through the relevant manufacturing processes to make them. And then finally, of course, tests. So this verification and validation of everything we've done in the virtual space, we've made them, and now we actually need to test them, whether it's benchtop testing or application-driven testing. And so with all of this kind of in the loop, of course, the next step is how do we scale this up? How do we bring this to industry to say, okay, how can we make these materials faster in relevant technologies? And that's something that we look at for quality and certification, what are the requirements, and also considering challenges with production. So what are the feedstock um, or production limitations and you know how can we address these? So that's kind of the, our technology pillars. And I know um, as part of today's workshop, I think there's also this component of education workforce development. And so that's also something at Lyft that we're really interested in. And we've actually developed some projects a little bit more on the technical side, so technical training. Um, and so we actually have a couple of programs where we're, at, where we're actually working with, for instance, in this middle line, Operation Next, is where we work with active duty servicemen and women. Uh, in their last couple of months in service, we actually get them through these certification processes for CNC uh, machining, welding, uh, robotics. So that way they actually have certifications in these skilled trades to actually bring them to the um, U.S. Um, basically manufacturing base, so we can bolster manufacturing in the United States. So again, just a little bit of a, I guess, a segue probably into the next section as well. But so with that, I wanted to end uh, really on this slide, because I think this is relevant to the, the panel discussion we'll be having today is really how can we accelerate these materials, these manufacturing processes into commercialization, into industry. And so I think we really need to consider the manufacturing readiness of these materials and what can we use in the context of data, algorithms, machine learning to accelerate these, for instance, for um, VNV, so verification and validation. Um, how can we trust the models that we're developing? How can we have confidence in the materials that we're producing that they'll be actually uh, application relevant? So, so with that, I'll hand it uh, back to Dr. Osis uh, and looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Hicks. And then we will continue with our last panelist, um, Dr. Kun Yu, who is a senior software and hardware engineer at NVIDIA. Um, he's, he has a number of uh, research uh, interests and applications, um, including uh, application-specific integrated circuits, blockchain authentications, system architecture, supporting software for, tool, for tools on multiple chips, convolutional neural network applications and materials discovery, uh, deep spiking neural nets for multiple applications, and neuromorphic systems for robotics. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Yu. Uh, thank you, Professor Corey. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, hi, uh, I'm a senior software hardware engineer from uh, Amelie. Uh, I have been uh, interested in the machine learning uh, research career uh, since my PhD. So we doing the application uh, specific integrated circuits. Between blockchain authentication systems, 
Uh, we also using a uh, convolution neural network applications on the material discovery. And also, uh, I also want to talk about the deep spike neural network and neuromorphic system. So uh, this is can is, is treated as a, the next uh, uh, level or next version of our, our current uh, artificial neural network. Uh, Mathematically, we can treat it as a, a neural network running on a sparse uh, matrix. Uh, however, our current uh, GPU or the other computing uh, chips cannot handle this uh, sparse uh, matrix very well because of it requires some more uh, or a huge, large uh, memory uh, blocks to process the sparsity of the metrics. Uh, instead of our current digital uh, GPU, CPU computing method, uh, neuromorphic system trying to adapt the analog computation method, uh, which instead of we store zero and ones in the hardware, we just uh, treat them as a pulses like analog signals, and the pulses represent the random ones. We it, it, it can drastically reduce the uh, the size of your your data and the parameters in your huge uh, networks, and uh, save power, save times, make it better. Uh, due to uh, this is the uh, material uh, references. Uh, I want to uh, introduce our recent publications, uh, motion recognition of a dress scheme or real interaction from a microtoma and Um So we proposed a novel and convenient method uh, to extract the DIMI magnitude from the first order reserve the curves, which are readily available for by common, uh, conventional magnetary measurements. Uh, we also demonstrate that the uh, conv convolutional neural network can successfully uh, correlate the forks with the DNA magnitude and achieve good uh, accuracy and robustness on simulated data. The reason we use uh, the convolutional network instead of the other uh, technology like transformers or RNNs because of the data we are treating uh, has limited number of pixels. And uh, the correlation of its pixels are uh, important. So we care about the near neighborhood uh, correlations instead of uh, uh, far, far, far neighborhood correlations. And the experiments uh, provided inside into the role of the DNI and other terms in the Hamilton for the formation and stability of a topological spin texture. We provided a data site including 20,000 family of forks with uh, different simulation parameters, uh, such as uh, saturation magnetizations, the exchange stiffness, and the DNI magnitude. Uh, we also have uh, the sample code and data site available on GitHub uh, if you guys are interested. Uh, that's all I want to share today. Thank you.